Chapter 21. David Shaler, Annie McCann and the UK 9-11 Truth Movement 2005-2009. November 2017. In this chapter, I discuss, some of the activities of the UK 9-11 Truth Movement, which I became involved with in mid-2005. What's left of the UK 9-11 Truth Movement can mainly be found on the UK 9-11 Truth Forum. This forum is now run by Tony Gosling, who runs www.bilderberg.org and has been featured on RT. Jim Robinson and I helped Simon Aronowitz and others set up this forum in June and July 2005. A number of other UK 9-11 Truth-related websites were in existence between about 2005 and 2010, with a number of local UK 9-11 groups, for example West Yorkshire, Bristol, Lewis and London. In parts of this chapter, I will be relating some of my personal experiences, which you will only have my word for. I don't have recordings or transcripts of the conversations themselves, which is what I have generally referenced everywhere else in this book, you can therefore decide for yourself whether what I am saying is true. Early Days, 2004 The beginnings of the UK campaign were probably in January 2004. Ian Neal had asked for a meeting with Simon Aronowitz. Nafis Ahmed and Ian Henshaw following Ian Neal becoming aware of Ian Henshaw's website, http colon slash slash www911 dossier.go.uk slash. Several concerned individuals in London had meetings about the problems with the official story, termed official conspiracy theory, OCT, of 9-11. Among this group were Ian Neal and Noel Glynn. I think they had been involved with the Stop the War group slash campaign. Ian Crane who had, somehow, been designated chairman of the British 9-11 Truth Campaign, had been researching problems with the official story since 2002. Justin Walker, a former Green Party member, had also been working more in the political paradigm and, with Simon Aronowitz and others, he delivered a deposition to Tony Blair's house in Sedgefield in 2005. Following a generous donation by Jimmy Walter, 17,000 copies of Walter's DVD presentation confronting the evidence were distributed to houses in the area. The Jimmy Walter Roadshow, May, June 2005 With the Friends Meeting House in Euston only about one-third filled, many of the campaigners mentioned above, and a good few others met for the first time as we listened to and watched Jimmy Walter, William Rodriguez, allegedly the last man to be pulled alive from the WTC rubble, Chris Bolin who is currently a died in the wool thermite sniffer, Thierry Mason and Derek Hufschmidt. The event was introduced by Ian Henshaw, more on Henshaw later. There was also a well-attended evening of movies in the Prince Charles Cinema off Leicester Square. An identical event in Manchester drew a larger attendance of about 500 people. These events were essentially a scaled-down replay of those that Jimmy organized in the USA. Jimmy then went on to deliver similar presentations in a number of European cities. UK 9-11 Internet Forum and Tony Gosling My involvement with the UK 9-11 Forum lasted just over two years. On the 12th of September 2007, I resigned from moderating the forum, though I continued to make occasional postings until 2011. The main reason I resigned was because of the actions of Tony Gosling himself who began editing and moving posts without my permission and he broke the moderation policy that we had loosely agreed. I became unhappy with the number of anonymous posters who hardly revealed anything about themselves and when asked, they often simply suggested they shouldn't be being asked. Their style of posting never really added much if anything to the debate and is typically framed in a sarcastic manner. Most of these posters used handles and a few used what appeared to be real names. I was particularly surprised when I posted the news about the unsealing of Dr. Morgan Reynolds' Gitam suit against NIST, for fraud, when it was moved to the controversial section, then Tony Gosling said he would move the post back if I convinced enough people that Morgan Reynolds' analysis was valid. How, exactly, would Tony judge the success of this? Would the almighty Tony Gosling have set up a poll and decided on a reasonable percentage of people convinced before he deigned to move my post back again? What gave Tony such authority? For example, what advanced degrees did he have, like Prof. Wood and Reynolds? 
The irony then became that as of the 11th of September 2007, the press release I wrote about the legal actions of Professor Judy Wood and Professor Morgan Reynolds made the front page of the now defunct Shoutwire News Service. Another problem was the constant trolling on this forum. This can still, in November 2017, be observed on the thread I referenced above, about Dr. Morgan Reynolds' key TAM case. There were several other people who were quite active on threads discussing Dr. Judy Wood's research, wanting to shoot it down in some way. They were John White, Gallum Douglas, using a handle of Snowy Grouch, Andy Baker and Stefan, whose surname I cannot remember. Numerous other anonymous trolls also seemed devoted to the ways of ridicule, insult and derision. Another person I was particularly disappointed with was Ian Neal, whom I counted as a friend. In a posting he made on the 16th of July 2009, he stated, Secondly Judy Woods is a really bad public presenter of science. I've watched her DVD presentations and I guarantee that a vast majority of her academic peers would agree with me that the way she presents her arguments in a lecture format is very poor indeed, and that's being kind. I asked Ian Neal how he could guarantee this. Had he collected email responses from a questionnaire sent to Judy Woods' peers? I would therefore characterize Ian Neal's statement as a lie. This is because he can make no such guarantee. You can see further responses on the thread referenced above, but it all becomes rather tiresome. I have, time and again, discussed how statements like this do not actually analyze what happened on the 11th of September, and rather they shift the reader's attention onto Judy Wood. Making negative remarks like this does not address the truth of what happened, or how to convey the truth more effectively. Following my departure from the UK 9-11 forum, I set up another forum at www.uk911.info, although this never became particularly active or useful. I tried to make the forum more troll-resistant by asking people to use their real names, but it became too time-consuming to try and establish the motives of people who wanted to post things. By that time, I had started to write articles about the cover-up which eventually became the 9-11 Finding the Truth book. I had also begun to help out with DRS Reynolds and Wood's key TAM documentation. David Shaler and Annie McKen. Two other more well-known people that got involved in the UK 9-11 Truth movement were David Shaler and Annie McKen. As I write this chapter in November 2017, they are still active in the truth-seeking slash alternative knowledge scene. In 1997, David Shaler became famous in the UK following him blowing the whistle when he was working for MI5. He received nationwide media attention for an extended period when he stated, during conversations in MI5, he had discovered a plot in MI6 to kill the then Libyan leader Colonel Gaddafi. Shaler was charged with breaking the official secrets act. After this, he and Annie Mukin went on the run from the UK, but Shaler was arrested in France in 1998. He eventually made a staged return to the UK and was arrested and then he served a short prison sentence. This was all written up in their book Spies, Lies and Whistleblowers, MI5, MI6 and the Shaler Affair. It seems that there was indeed a plot to kill Gaddafi, but maybe it could never be linked to MI6, I don't know. What I do know is that Gaddafi was killed in October 2011. Some people suggest this was because Libya had a banking system which was not fully controlled by the global banking cartel and so the regime in power had to be toppled so that this could be changed. Indeed, you can read quite a number of books and articles which strongly suggest that this is often the reason for regime change, that is to take control of their banking system, as well as any resources etc. During meetings in either 2004 or early 2005, David Shaler and Annie McKen came into contact with members of the then embryonic London 9-11 Truth Group and soon after, started to speak publicly about 9-11 Truth issues. Rather abruptly, David's involvement as a speaker for the Stop the War Coalition came to an end, they refused to give him a platform, despite the evidence, to talk about 9-11 Truth. In late 2005, I got in touch with them and invited them to speak at an event I organized in Derby at the now defunct Metro Cinema, where I showed the original Loose Change film and David and Annie made short presentations. About 130 people attended this presentation. I also organized a venue in Nottingham for them to speak at, but had little chance to publicize this and so no one attended. 
After the event, they stayed at my house and I got time to speak to them. We seemed to get on very well. I paid their travel expenses, mainly out of my own pocket, I received some donations at the event. In October 2006, I actually went to meet one-time cabinet minister Michael Meacher, who had publicly expressed skepticism about the official narrative of 9-11, in his Oldham constituency, I was accompanied by Annie McCann and Justin Walker. I presented Meacher with a 200-page document summarizing our activities as a group for the 2005 to 2006 period. Nothing obvious came of this meeting, though there were apparently several MPs who Meacher had spoken to who were also skeptical of the official 9-11 narrative and I remember, at one point, there being talk of a showing of the loose change film to a group of MPs in London. William Rodriguez, Last Man Out Tour, February 2007 William Rodriguez had claimed, since at least 2005, that he was the last man out of the World Trade Center on the 11th of September and he was almost killed. You can read about his story online and watch videos of his presentations. He had spoken at many venues in the UK and Europe and had, for some time, toured with Jimmy Walter, as mentioned above. It is interesting to note that Rodriguez split from Walter when Walter started to take the no-planes at the WTC issue seriously. As part of his last man out tour in February 2007, he stayed at my house when he was accompanied by Annie McCann. I organized two venues for them, to speak at, one in Spondon, Derbyshire, the Astordale Club, and another at the Caslane Church Centre in central Birmingham. The events took place on Friday 16th and Saturday 17th of February 2007. Also, on the Friday, I took Rodriguez for an interview on BBC Radio Derby with Shane O'Connor. O'Connor barely spoke to me but he had done his research on Rodriguez, and noted in conversation that Rodriguez had worked at one time with debunker magician James Randi. I did not know this at the time, but Rodriguez verbally confirmed that this was true. During the evening, at my house, I was also quite surprised at how well he was able to operate his laptop, connect to my wireless network and talk to his partner on Skype. I am quite familiar with how people who are confident with laptops, Wi-Fi and so forth are able to work with devices, compared to those that are not confident. My intuitive reaction was this man is not just a janitor. On the morning of Saturday 17th of February 2007, we went to BBC Radio Birmingham, see photo. Whilst we were waiting at a coffee shop just outside, he was chatting and saying that he thought the story of 9-11 was like the story of Jesus and that Annie McCann was like Mary Magdalene. He suggested that two other guys who were with us, Anthony Beckett and another chap called John who was making a film about Rodriguez, could be the apostles and then he said, who can be Judas? And he said Morgan Reynolds can be Judas. Of course, you only have my word for this part, as I don't have a recording. I thought this was most peculiar as Morgan Reynolds was in the process of setting up a court cases against NIST contractors, for their part in committing a fraud in relation to their 9-11 technical reports. I have archived the interview he did with Janice Long on the 17th of February 2007, although I used the wrong date of the 18th of February on the file name. I became more suspicious of Rodriguez when I heard a portion of his interview on Simon Mayo's popular Radio 5 Live program on the 23rd of February 2007, probably heard by over one million people in the UK, when he said, I agree that a lot of the conspiracies are wrong, I am not contending that. Remember, the idea here is to dispel. Many people have come out and said there were no planes hitting the buildings which is ridiculous because we have actually gone with cameras to interview people in the ground zero area and they have come along, and said, we saw the planes, we saw the parts. Some people say that there were holograms to superimpose these on televisions. Other people say it was CGI other people came out and say. Morgan Reynolds for example and Judy Woods which were people that worked with the Bush administration say that it was weaponry of exotic kind. That they have some kind of infrared satellite. They have this technology that will bring the towers down. So, you know. Ridiculous thing after ridiculous thing. Only two people are named in this clip. These were the same two people I had begun to communicate with extensively around that time. Though I cannot say I trust everything Nika Haupt came out with, he did seem to collect some useful information about Rodriguez on a forum posting on the now defunct 911researchers.com. After his stay with us, 
Rodriguez never thanked me or my wife for putting him up and organizing an event for him to speak at. Belinda McKenzie, David Shaler and Annie McKen. I got to know Belinda McKenzie in 2004 due to her support of Lloyd Pye and the Star Child Skull. In late 2004 or early 2005, it was probably me that first showed her a video about the disappearance of the towers, I was still calling it freefall collapse then, however. She then supported Jimmy Walter when he came to London, with his confronting the evidence tour, and Berlinda stored quite a few boxes of David Ray Griffin books in her lock-up garage in Highgate. Three years later, I had realized Dr. Judy Wood's research explained what happened to the WTC, but Belinda didn't quite seem to get it. If I had ever felt the need to directly ask for support in matters relating to the dissemination of 9-11 truth, Belinda McKenzie would have been one person I thought I could count on. However, following the William Rodriguez tour in February 2007, I had a telephone conversation with Belinda in which I discussed a peculiar incident that happened between Annie McKen and Rodriguez. The nature of this incident caused me to be concerned that neither Rodriguez nor McKen were being totally honest and they lacked integrity. I discussed the details of this with Berlinda and Berlinda only. This was because, at the time, Annie was a lodger at Berlinda's house. Annie and David Shaler lived in Berlinda's house for several months, shortly thereafter, Annie McCann was sending round an email to a list of about ten people claiming that, though I was reliable in relation to dealings with her regarding 9-11 truth issues, I had been spreading rumors about her. Note, Annie McCann did not privately address me in email, she included several other people in the list of recipients. So it was she that spread the rumor. I simply had a private telephone conversation with Berlinda, expressing my concern. In other words, Annie McKen attempted to smear me for making up stories about her. However, I had a witness to the incident and so her attempts failed. After a direct request from me, it was Annie McKen who refused to discuss Dr. Wood's Keytam case in 2007 and 2008, because she thought it was speculation. Annie part is part of the cover-up crew. Shayla talks no planes and becomes the new messiah. In August 2006, David Shaler appeared on Sky News and discussed details of why the official narratives of both 9-11 and 7-7 could not be true. He talked about the lack of plane crash investigations on the 11th of September as well as their disinformation, evidence for controlled demolition of the buildings, I can forgive him for that, as I was still talking about the same things then, perhaps David Shaler had gone too far and, like David Ock in 2002, was getting ahead of the script. Only a year after this Sky News broadcast, he was again in the news, claiming that he was the new messiah. Again, this seems very similar to what happened to David Ock in 1991. In an article in the Daily Mail in August 2007, Annie McKen stated, He was in trouble. He was quick to anger if anyone questioned him. He became obsessive about little details, espoused wacky theories and shunned his family and old friends. His paranoia also escalated. Shayla and McCann separated around the same time. In 2009, Shayla was reported to have adopted an alter ego, which involved him dressing as a woman and calling himself Dolores. David Shayla was no longer a problem for the establishment. Belinda hosts Fetzer. My trust in Berlinda McKenzie essentially dropped to zero in 2010, when I was visiting Lloyd Pye again. He was staying at Belinda's while doing a few more talks. During my visit, who should I find staying in her house? Jim Fetzer and Kevin Barrett. I told her repeatedly what they were up to, but she didn't seem that interested in what I had to say about them being part of the 9-11 cover-up crew. Please see the first volume of my book for more information about Jim Fetzer's antics. Belinda even attended a talk in London in 2012, or perhaps 2011 by someone called Tracy Blevins, and she herself is yet another story, who was talking about Dr. Wood's research. This talk was not widely advertised, I found out about it by accident. I mention this because Tracy Blevins had come over from the USA. Why didn't the group that organized the talk invite Dr. Wood, or even myself, to talk about her research? This, in itself, is not the main issue. What was weird was to me was that Berlinda had not contacted me at all about this event, for example, to obtain copies of Dr. Wood's book Where Did the Towers Go? Which was, apparently, the subject of Tracy Blevins' presentation. 
This is a rather long-winded way of saying that Berlinda has, for me, failed the 9-11 litmus test. There are other factors, too, which made me conclude she was not totally on the level and she was either being manipulated, or she was choosing to ignore important things and thereby help the cover-up crew. Ian R. Crane It was in 2005 that I first encountered Ian R. Crane in the UK 9-11 Truth campaign, when he was said to be its chairman. Since then he has talked about the events of 9-11 in many of his public presentations. However, he has never, to my knowledge discussed the WDTTG book. In Chapter 12, I already covered how Crane said there was no explanation for the WTC towers turning to dust. He avoids this topic. In 2009, I was asked to give a presentation in the south of England, on the subject of chemtrails, sea climate change and global warming, exposed, and I was happy to accept the invitation. I spent two nights in the area where the presentation was and enjoyed a very warm welcome and great hospitality. In conversation with one of the people, I will call him John, who had helped to organize the presentation, Ian Crane's name came up. John explained that he had approached Ian Crane to sound him out about being a speaker at a possible conference he was organizing. John also mentioned the subject of 9-11 in relation to the conference. Ian Crane offered John some advice about organizing the conference and then asked who else John was thinking of inviting to the conference. John replied to Ian Crane that he was thinking of inviting me. At this point, Ian Crane said to John that he wouldn't share a platform with Andrew Johnson on the subject of 9-11. For the record, I would be quite happy to share a platform with Ian Crane and talk about 9-11 because I know that what I have been telling people in this book, and in my presentations, is true. Not only that, but I am happy to receive corrections or augmentations from anyone who has verifiable evidence to add to what I have talked about. I would be able to discuss anything Ian Crane didn't understand in relation to the truth. I was later to realize that Ian Crane probably wasn't interested in the truth about how the WTC was destroyed. On the 12th of December 2009, Crane and myself, along with Tony Gosling and Brian Jerish spoke at the Wake Up Call conference in Kirkcaldy 5. We were all staying at the same hotel, with some extremely noisy people in the room next to mine, as I recall. While we were sat in the hotel lounge, bar area, there were a couple of people, one of whom was Adrian Connock. I think it was Adrian who mentioned something about Tony Gosling's UK 9-11 forum activities and the episode where I had resigned from it, because Gosling had edited and moved posts. Ian Crane asked what we were talking about, as he had not been very active on the UK 9-11 forum at the time I resigned though he posted fairly regularly during the 2005 to 2006 period, I recall. I explained to Ian Crane about Gosling's soft censorship of my post about the Wood slash Reynolds Gitam cases, discussed earlier in this chapter. Ian Crane said well, to be honest, I would have done the same. So, it seemed Ian Crane agreed with the soft censorship Gosling had enacted. I therefore asked Ian Crane if, in his talks and presentations, he was presenting evidence to people to show them that what he was saying was true. I pointed out to him that this was exactly what Wood and Reynolds were doing, except that they had prepared the evidence to go to a court, where they could be subject to cross-examination and possible prosecution if they were found to be being frivolous or deceptive. To my surprise, dismay even, Ian Crane responded, you're pissing in the wind. At this point we can perhaps consider that Ian Crane used to work for Schlumberger, an oil industry service consultancy company. Is this why he never talks about the obvious once studied connection between the events of 9-11 and the free energy cover-up? Conclusions From my experience, then, the cover-up of what really happened on the 11th of September is operated on a global scale, with speakers and researchers in the UK working to insert doubt, mislead and misdirect other people, in just the same way as I documented in 9-11 Finding the Truth. We will examine other UK-based cover-up activities in Chapter 23.